Oh, there I am. Okay. It's 10 o'clock. Hi, everybody. I'm trying out a new platform today, so if there's something weird, please Hi, let me know. I'm trying out a new platform Whoops. today, so if there's something weird, please let me know. Whoops. <laughs> Hi, Jorge. How are you doing? Great. So as you can see, I um, jumped on StreamYard because I thought it looks really nice to have um, the comments from, from the audience kind of highlighted. So I thought that's a good, good reason to try out a little bit. Um, personally, I was having some problems with the audio playback, which I think is a kind of important part of what I do. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how this, this works. Hi, Emily. Thanks for joining in. So um, I guess let's jump into it. Uh, I'm obviously a little bit more. I'm obviously a little bit more nervous today because it's just me talking, and it's kind of weird because usually speaking to an audience is so much. Uh, speaking to a, um, a guest is so much easier. I ask them questions, and I just sit back and enjoy. But today um, I'm kind of on my own. Uh, hi, Jeff. Good to hear from you. Wow, it's been a while. So today I'm on my own, um, and the reason why I thought it would be meaningful for me uh, to do this, actually meaningful for the audience to do this, to share my journey from kind of um, uh, how I got into music and eventually kind of dropping out of music class in high school to eventually, you know, going to a, a wonderful music school and um, having the immense uh, pleasure working with some of the greatest musicians in the world. Um, I thought this kind of, this journey would be, a good maybe there are some good stories that people will be able to take something out from um and perhaps more importantly i have to say when i was growing up i didn't really have such models that i look up to um in in the vicinity so you know it was really kind of i'm on my own and trying to figure out what would be uh the way to go so i thought perhaps sharing my story might give um, some of the audience some uh, perhaps some inspiration or perhaps something to, to relate to and saying, oh, that was me uh, or that is what I've been feeling and, you know, hopefully uh, it could inspire you to, to, to go further. So, great. Um, one other reason why I've decided to do this episode is because my good friend Emily, um, there she is, <laughs> uh, she sent me a couple of questions, uh, uh, interview questions, um, for the Composer Society of Singapore, um, they wanted to feature me, and so she asked me a couple of questions, and I thought, wow, why don't I um, answer these questions in an episode? So again, it's kind of a leap of faith. I decided to do it without my... my I decided to do it with my heart instead of my brain, and so now I'm kind of freaking out, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, I guess, like the title of this episode, um, the subtitle of this episode... Uh, the best way to learn is to do. Just do it first. Um, it's going to be not great, but we learn from there. Oh, hello from Mongolia. That's really fantastic. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of Emily's questions, and then we can just start from there. So the first question she asked me is, uh, how did I get into music? And um, I didn't really grow up in a musical household. And my, actually, my first musical memory came uh, when I was in primary school or elementary school. Um, there was an old piano at the, at the edges of the canteen. And um, although I never really learned to play the piano when I was growing up, nor did I have a piano uh, at my home, I always loved to hear the other kids playing on it um, and, and you know, kind of drawing a crowd and making 
music and I always secretly wish I could make some beautiful sounds on the piano as well. But we didn't have a piano at home. And so eventually there was a recruitment drive um, to join the, the primary school brass band. So I signed up for that and you know I got handed a trombone and kind of was hooked onto music for life. So um, what... Uh, I was kind of a band geek in my, you know, uh, school days, and always going to concerts and hanging out with the band people. And that's kind of, that's kind of where most of my, most of the uh, friends in the music world, you know, that's how we got started. Um, and eventually, when I entered university, uh, my first major was actually not music. I decided to major in history because um, it, didn't, uh, it didn't occur to me that I wanted to do music um, professionally or for the rest of my life. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to, to take, um, to do kind of a liberal, liberal arts, uh, kind of true, taking as many classes as I can and then eventually deciding on something that I liked. And I obviously loved uh, history the most. Um, but after doing that for one year, which I was actually very, very happy, um, then there was a sp uh, spot open at the conservatory and they were uh, looking for um, a trombonist. So I decided to sign up for the audition and um, by some <laughs> heavenly intervention, I, I, got into the, um, I got into the school, which was fantastic. Uh, at that point, I was playing trombone for quite some time already, um, taking on some gigs here and there. And I would not really consider myself as a very talented trombone player. Uh, I had you know, enough chops to, to get by, but I was always a little bit frustrated um, at certain things. So going to music school and really studying the trombone was kind of a leap of faith, uh, but I'm really glad I did it. Oh, hi, Cheryl. And... Um, Eventually, what got me into uh, conducting um, was a little bit later when I was, I remember very, very clearly when I was uh, a trombone undergraduate, I told myself, I'm just going to do trombone because I really enjoy this view from the back row. You know, the trombone section usually sits at the back of the orchestra and, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of minding our own business and doing our own stuff. And uh, and I remember one of my teachers um, saying the trombone section is kind of like the artillery in the in the orchestra because when we arrive, you know, it makes a point. It's very very prominent, uh, but most of the time you don't really see much action. Oh, hi Leslie! Wow, I think history is really fun for me because I really enjoyed studying about kind of the region, which you know it, it kind of connects back to what I'll talk about later. So uh, eventually, I um, the conducting bug never really bit me until much later in my undergraduate studies. Actually, I would say probably in my third and fourth year that I set, decided to do um, the uh, conducting class because it was a requirement. And then I started to realize, wow, I really enjoy doing this. At the same time, I was also doing um, quite a bit of chamber music, which I credit you know, a lot of my learnings. Um, and working with people and problem solving too, because working with uh, f you know playing in a brass quintet, for example, you are working with four very very talented uh, colleagues, and you are really trying to to produce a great result together. Um, and it's not kind of a top down um, perspective, uh, a top top down instructions. No, but we are trying. How can we make this better? And so it's kind of a cooperative and kind of a. Um, uh, a very respectful mindset that I felt really got me off to a good start when I started conducting because I, I didn't feel like, you know, I was standing in front and kind of ordering people to do stuff, but rather we were trying to make something together and, um, and it becomes a conversation and it becomes something that is more, um, what's the word, collaborative or a kind of a team effort um, to, to, to produce a musical result. So uh, I started conducting, in all honesty, when I started to do my conducting auditions, when I applied for my master conducting auditions. And it was, um, it was really kind of crazy because I never really had much conducting experience before, besides putting up a group to make conducting tapes uh, to, to send for auditions. So when I started, 
I remember my first conducting audition was at Cincinnati, uh, um, the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, long name. But uh, I remember standing in front of the symphonic band, uh, or the symphony band it was then called, and, and I was just completely touched by um, the sound they made. I remember the audition piece was Granger's uh, Lincolnshire Posey, and the audition piece was uh, the second and third movement, so the slow movement of it, um, and just hearing the, the beautiful sound, even sitting at the side when it was not my turn, but we were all watching each other, uh, it, it just melted me, and I decided at that point, like, you know, I really wanted to do this, and, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. And so somehow, by, again, another, you know, heavenly intervention, I managed to get a, a spot in Cincinnati, which was quite a prestigious um, uh, prestigious studio in the States. So I, I started to get my conducting studies there, and eventually I ended up at Eastman School of Music to do orchestral conducting, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and how I got into new music was actually during my time at Eastman. I think I've spoken a little bit about uh, how much I'm very grateful um, to my training at Eastman. Uh, I remember speaking especially to John Lin because we were both Eastman alumni. And uh, what was so wonderful about being at Eastman was that there was such an active new music um, scene. So the composers were actively writing stuff and there were also a lot of performers who were very willing to try new things. And um, there were also two kind of new music ensemble. One was the school's official new music ensemble. And uh, oh yeah, Jabat, Eastman. <laughs> and the other was a, a student-run new music ensemble called Sia. So there was a lot of opportunities to work on new music and to work with composers. Um, and there was one particular incident, not incident, one particular experience. Uh, this was um, uh, Jacinto Shausi's Anahit, which is a, a piece for, I think, 18 instruments and a violin soloist. And that was kind of my first introduction into you know, kind of European contemporary music. And... Uh, Chelsea is a is an Italian composer, and you know one of the the masters of this so-called um, spectral school. Um, maybe I'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, that's really kind of uh, it, 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 the the piece was really a for me a journey of a note to an, a a G um, to to. Uh, it, it it goes that there's a lot of microtonal stuff. It changes. It, it it was a piece that, in some way, was kind of easy to put together, because you know everything's kind of in four in a relatively slow tempo, and you could you could put everything vertically together very very quickly. But I wasn't really sure what I was supposed to do. You know, I kind of tidied things up with whatever conducting I have. So I thought, you know, I, I think I'm good. And then at that point, there was another teacher, a conducting teacher. Uh, his name was Brett Lutman. And, I, and he, is, um, he does a new music ensemble there. And he has a big career um, uh, in, in Europe and also in the States, conducting orchestras, mainly doing contemporary music. But he was a professor at Eastman for a long time. And so I asked him whether he was free to just give me a coaching. Um, just to see how I'm doing because I, I felt kind of stuck. I was kind of running at the plateau because I didn't know what else I can do. And he came for one session and he really changed my my uh, experience of new music from then on. Then I suddenly, suddenly realized that it's not just disconnected notes and just kind of putting it together, but really understanding that you know music that we're doing now is really related to a canon uh, of, of works from the past. And he would do a lot of, you know, maybe off the cuff or um, in interactions, uh, sorry, off the cuff or off the cuff, what's the word? Um, uh, relations to pieces. So he was saying, oh, look at this moment. It really feels like a Mahler symphony, right? And how about this moment? Imagine this is that, and imagine this is that. And suddenly I started to realize, oh my God, there's so much deeper meaning than you know what's on the surface and i started to listen more openly because previously i was just concerned about whether this and this lines up this and this lines up but i'm done and then i realized there's so much deeper uh, meaning to 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 looking beyond the notes looking at how um and being very very sensitive to all the little nuances all the little you know um it, 
uh, the articulations or the dynamics and when you actually put a lot of care and detail into trying to materialize these dynamics or these details um, everything starts to pop everything starts to make a lot more sense and it was from that moment on that, that I started becoming much more interested in, in contemporary music because previously you know like many of my friends it's something that I do that I can do uh, doesn't mean I know how to do doesn't mean I'm really good at it but after that experience it really changed my mind and it, it, it uh, forced me to look deeper and trying to to find something that connects to me emotionally. I think that was also the other thing about the shell scene. Um, when you hear it for the first time, you, 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 you are amazed by the incredible sounds and the incredible textures. But the more you dig deeper into it, the more you start to realize that there's a very, very powerful emotional um, intent. Uh, if anybody could, could correct me, I think shell scene was one of... Uh, it's, it's, there's a legendary story about Shaoxi where he went up to the mountains and he stayed there for a long period of time and during that period of time he was just he was just listening to a single note on the piano there was a piano there and he just listened to that one note throughout this time where he was up in the mountains and, and he just started to hear so much more than just one note he started to hear a lot more about the, 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 kind of the overtones and the harmonics and you know the the, the depth, the deep, um, uh, so so many dimensions from just one note. And I thought that was really uh, interesting. So how did I get into music? So yeah, wow. <laughs> uh, eventually, um, I, I started to work professionally. I got my first position working in Poland with the radio orchestra uh, at the end, very, very luckily at the end of my DMA studies at Eastman. And uh, ever since... Um, I started working with a lot of you know wonderful musicians, uh, and one particular one that I, I always like to mention is Peter Edvoch because he really changed my idea about what conducting is and and how um, and how I look at compositions. So right now, uh, for the audience that um, I haven't been catching up with in a long time, uh, I'm currently working in the Yongsuto Conservatory of Music, which is the uh, the school that I went to when I was an undergrad. And uh, working with the new music ensemble, and and it has been a, a really fun journey so far. Oh, hi, Cherry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think Brett Lutman. Anybody who went to Eastman would would say. I mean, Brett Lutman is really quite um, a force of nature to have worked with, especially with contemporary music. So, uh, next question that Emily asked me was, what attracts me to new music as a conductor? So, I guess. Um, the first and foremost reason why new music is so interesting after that experience is because I'm really in awe of composers. I look at a page and and um especially living composers and I'm just floored by the the composer's ability to pick sound out of thin hair and to organize them in new and meaningful ways and then eventually setting them into paper. So that whole process, the whole creative process is endlessly fascinating to me. I've taken composition lessons and, um, and I remember composing a piece that was really just derivative of uh, Takemitsu's um, music. I took his harmonic palette and I try and play around with it and ended up sounding like kind of a nice piece but really wasn't saying anything so I didn't want to go deeper into that. But the, 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 this ability uh, was really super fascinating to me. And also on top of that, I mean the, the widely... Uh, diverse styles of contemporary music today. Uh, if you've been catching, you know, the series for the past the ten episodes, you can see that how contemporary music really varies from each composer to another composer, and different styles and different uh, place where they work. You know, that all affects their their music. And so this diversity is so refreshing because you you will never get sick of doing it. Every piece offers a new challenge. Every piece um, has something that you, you, you need to figure out. So that aspect of it being in a puzzle uh, is, is super interesting to me. Um, so on top of that, I think the, the, the expanded means of expression is uh, very intriguing because you know most of the, the for myself, um, I guess starting from, let's say, pop music. Pop music has... Um, recognizable tunes and, and all that thing. And it, for me, the, the main message of most, maybe 80% of pop music is really about love, 
It's really about, you know, uh, heartbreak. And it, that's something that we can all relate to, which is fantastic. But uh, it's a little bit limited in, in the scope. Um, oh, hi, Tianhui. Greetings from Massachusetts. It's a limited in the scope. And for me, classical music, what, what it expanded that emotion. So you get to feel a, a whole wide range from, from intense, you know, joy, aesthetic happiness, kind of Gloria, uh, Gloria-esque brilliance to really deep and dark, um, and troubling emotions um, or tranquility. I mean, th that's something that, that, that classical music really brings to me, the expanded vocabulary of emotions that we experience as, as human beings. Um, and what contemporary music furthers this expression is that there are more um, there are more means and more atmosphere and that thing, things that are outside of this traditional Western canon that finally there is a voice to be heard. So to me, that's also super interesting. Um, and lastly, I guess the 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 most fun part about um, contemporary music is because it's incredibly difficult. Uh, and that difficulty presents itself as a, as a very challenging puzzle to me. And I, I love puzzles. I love trying to take things apart piece by piece, layer by layer. And, and the most satisfying part of taking apart a very complicated piece is, is to realize that, oh, actually the, um, the, the gem, uh, oh, sorry, the gem of the piece is, is very simple. And it's just all the manipulations that make it into this comp incredibly complex piece. So for me, that is uh, a, a challenge, but always something that I'm looking forward to. Great. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask. Um, there's a, a question asking about what's my favorite symphony and why. I will get to that later. That's one of the questions that Emily asked that I would love to, to talk about. So... Um, how does your trombone playing and knowledge of wind and orchestral conducting help you in deciphering new music? So as I mentioned, I think the most valuable part of my trombone playing was really uh, chamber music. That, that um, experience of working with, with uh, my peers and, um, and in, in many ways, I was kind of the most vocal person in the group also, you know, always suggesting, can we do this this way? Can we do it that way? But that really got my feet wet about how to, how to tackle a problem. Oh, this is a problem that we have. How can we try to practice it in a way that we can solve that problem? Um, I guess my orchestral experience also uh, contributes to the fact that I was spending a lot of time looking at orchestral scores because, um, like I say, we didn't have a lot of notes to play. So there's a lot of time sitting in the rehearsal and just, you know, uh, figuring out, you know, what is the conductor saying? Is he, is he making sense? Or, oh, I really like what he did there. And so I was kind of taking notes and, and following along with the full score uh, because I was sitting around for the most part. So that kind of contributed to a, a repertoire of, of skills that I've accumulated over the years. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, I, I did wind band conducting when I was at Cincinnati. And uh, it was a, a very interesting experience because it taught me a lot about organization. This point, this was my first conducting degree. I had no conducting experience whatsoever before. So I really learned a lot from my peers when I was at CCM. Uh, and many of them who are, you know, high school, who have worked in high school as, as band teachers. Um, so they have a very, very clear idea on how to organize, you know, everything. How to organize the rehearsal down to the very minute, 10, 15 to... Uh, to 10.35, we will do this measure to this measure because we want to uh, achieve this objective and that objective. And to me, that's incredible. That amount of planning, uh, oh, in some ways, uh, a role as a teacher. So that's something that I really learned a lot about at Cincinnati in the wind conducting part. And then... Um, and the, the running joke we had in the wind department, so to speak, is that we always make fun of the orchestral people because they were always less organized. They were always kind of running around. Um, and uh, also maybe they were younger. The, 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 the wind folks were a little bit older. And so when I eventually started studying orchestral conducting, uh, I started to understand, yeah, I think orchestral conducting might be more... Um, more artistic. I don't want to use that in a bad way. Um, but, you know, pe people are more concerned about expression. 
concerned about what they want to say, concerned about uh, the um, like, like what what they felt the music was about. Whereas previously it was it was a very not logistical, but it was a much more organized, much more objective view of how to how to make music. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, so when I went to orchestra, I, I started to think more as an artist, you know, kind of living in the now, kind of more big picture. And um, in, in some ways, I, I would say conducting an orchestra and conducting wind band is slightly different because in an in a orchestra, there's a lot more about trusting the musicians to find themselves and to enable them, to give them the space to, to make music. Whereas in the wind band, you kind of have to, to drive the engine a little bit. It's a very, very subtle difference. Uh, I, I, it's, it's hard for me to say, but when you stand in front of the ensemble, you understand uh, what these differences are, at least to me. So how does all that relate to new music? Because eventually, you, you have to have various aspects. You have to combine all these skills together, um, understanding how to work with people, understanding um, how you need to plan your rehearsals in a way so that it doesn't waste anybody's time. But at the same time, it's also such a difficult piece so you have to um, to organize how you peel the different layers um, especially now in my current uh, job working mostly with students uh, many of them come with you know the, the kind of deers and headlights uh, like how am I supposed to to work on this rhythm that I cannot even sing and so it, it, then you have to understand how can I simplify this problem for them how can I teach them to teach themselves and how can I reinforce maybe some of the big concepts that were, were uh, uh, taught by other teachers? Um, then, on top of that, it comes back to my experience at Eastman, then how do I inspire and invoke all these images that's not apparent from the ink? The ink is usually kind of busy or usually kind of bizarre for most of the people, so they get stuck at the first layer. We never really get into the music because they are so... Uh, thrown off by things that that they they were not familiar with, but actually in actual terms, like I mentioned, once you start peeling off the different layers, you start to realize actually it's very very simple. Why, for example, why did the the violas and the cellos why do they have different rhythms? Why is one a septuple and one a, 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 a sextuple, for example? Uh, 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 yeah, sextuple. And um, previously, I always thought, oh, then it's it's messy. That it, it it cannot be together. But that's the whole point of it. The whole point of the composer writing this gesture is that it's supposed to be messy. The composer writing a gesture where there is a lot of, uh, where it's figurations, you know, it, it, it's a texture. You want the texture to go, and uh, does it have to be super accurate? Not really, but it needs to have a feel. It needs to have a certain, you know, a certain texture. And then there are certain parts where you have to be together, that the, the rhythmic aspects need to be all locked in. So that eventually you know you through experience you start to learn to see which are the which are the parts that needs to be um, clarified and which are the parts that you can you can you know not gloss over but you are really going into what the composer had in mind why did he write it this way he wrote it this way because he didn't want them to be together so I'm not going to waste time trying to you know fix them vertically or oh, this part has to be together because of a certain reason here and there uh yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, next, uh, how did you decide to start unboxing new music and what do you hope to achieve with this series? So, um, this <laughs> I decided to start this because my wife called me a tech dinosaur. Uh, I think she was she was um, watching some Facebook live or some Instagram live and you're like, hey, you should you should totally do this. Because why are you not doing this? Why are you just sitting around studying scores and not not you know contributing your voice? And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna do it. And so I I decided to talk about a uh, score study, which is uh an, an uh, uh, aspect that is very very important in the art of conducting. And uh, from there on, I decided, hey, you know what? I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna commit myself. Um, I found a couple of uh, really wonderful composers that I really enjoy. And, uh, and ask them if they would like to be interviewed by me. And uh, a, a lot of them say yes, thankfully. And so that's, that's where we are. Um, on top of that, it's also my interest in the region. Um, I've only been back in Singapore last January. So I, I, I would say I'm still relatively 
uh, new to all the developments in you know neighboring countries that I'm not aware of. So I I really wanted to find out more about what other composers are doing in um, both in Singapore and also in uh, all these countries around us. And uh, my my lack of knowledge, you know, kind of propelled me to pursue this. Let's do this. Let's ask questions. Let's talk to people. And so that's how uh, things got started. Um, and my objective of doing this is really to promote and to develop a better appreciation of contemporary music, especially um, by the Singaporean and also the Southeast Asian composers, um, by you know showing their pieces and talking to them and to find a lot more uh, um, insights and, and to give kind of a, a behind-the-scenes view of what they were thinking. Because a lot of times when music... Um, it needs repeated listening to get into. And when there is no introduction or there is no help to guide one's years, uh, it's often very, very daunting. So I decided that um, maybe, you know, listening to a piece and then talking about it and then eventually pasting the links for uh, the audience to have repeated listening after that would be a good idea. So that's kind of a, a, um, a structure that I thought would be helpful. On top of that, I think it, it's important to expose to the audience and to myself as well about the rich diversity of artistic life um, in Singapore and also in the region. Um, there's so much going on and, uh, and that needs attention and that needs a little bit of spotlight. And eventually, I hope uh, we can you know, eventually go on to live performances. You know, now we are all in phase two of um, uh, this this pandemic uh, um, f reaction and so I was one long term goal and hopefully not so long term is to eventually you know that we can put on performances and then record them and, and present them digitally so fingers crossed on that happening and um, yeah I'm looking forward to that yeah <laughs> uh, Emily saying that yes the f uh, three days before the first episode yeah I decided why not let's just do it uh, again, going back to the point, the, the best way to learn how to do it is just to do it. And um, I was looking up YouTube tutorials um, and websites and, and you know, just kind of challenging myself to, to take in as much as possible. And um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, what are a few pieces on my bucket? conducting list. Ooh, that's a lot. That's a lot, a lot, a lot of pieces. Uh, a lot of pieces I haven't done before and I would die to do it. Uh, I guess um, not a pluck for myself, but I, I'm doing a concert in um, November in Hungary and that's kind of the final concert of this uh, mentoring program that I'm on. Uh, I'm, I'm very looking forward to that concert because it features two of my favorite pieces uh, for orchestra. Uh, one is the Lutosławski Concerto for Orchestra and uh, the other is Britain's uh, 4C Interlude. And uh, the Lutosławski is a very special piece to me because it was a piece that I really learned. I learned for my audition when I got into the orchestra in Poland and, um, and then it, the orchestra performed it a couple of times when I was there. And this is a piece that, you know, this is a signature piece of the orchestra. Um, Lutoslavski conducted this, made a recording with them, and you know the players know the music at the back of their hands. It's a super difficult piece. Um, you know they had the bowings from you know many years ago with with some of the greatest um, musicians, and so that's a piece that you know I've, I've really grown to to love. Uh, Lutoslavski himself reportedly said that this is not his best piece. It's kind of a, a very very early piece from the fifties. And it was kind of still in the folkloric style, which he eventually, you know, moved away from. Um, but still, I think it's it's such a powerful piece, and especially the last movement, which is very very long, um, uh, kind of in two parts. I I always I always marvel at how um, when things seem to be ending, and then he goes on again. Uh, not again, not like Beethoven in that way, but it, th there's there's more invention and and it, it, it always surprises me in a, in a genuinely fascinating way. It's like oh my god, he's still he's still doing it, and there's more, and there's more, and there's more, and the ending is just kind of a a, a crazy rush. Um, 
so uh, the Britain Four C interludes is uh, it's a piece I've listened to. S- wow, I I don't know since maybe secondary school or or JC, and I just it, it's just a piece that is so beautiful, and um, I just had a connection to it immediately hearing it. And I'm so excited to be able to do, you know, these pieces. So uh, hopefully, you know, the the travel restrictions will will ease, and I'll be able to do the concert. On top of that, I'm also doing a new violin concerto premiere uh, by my dear friend Dong Hun Shin, which I you know, we talked about his piece earlier, I think last week um, or two weeks ago. And so that's kind of a dream concert. Um, there are some pieces that I've learned during my time in Poland um, that I would love to do. Uh, Szymanowski is very, very high on my list. Uh, Szymanowski is maybe to many people, you know, really only known for the violin concertos, which I think are incredible and ama- amazing pieces. But his symphonies and also kind of his theater stage works, his opera, um, uh, King Roger. I mean, it's it's to me Szymanowski. Uh, I once described it as a. a um, it's like a, a, a cross between Ravel and Strauss, but sexier. It's like scrubbing, but much more sensual and not so you know, in your face. So Szymanowski, um, the textures are just beautiful. And and the funny thing is, sometimes you might not be able to, to exactly sing the melody from a Szymanowski piece, but the feeling of of just... Like even talking about it, I can feel my, my, my hair standing. And there's this... There's this sense of it's as if the the sound is like a very beautiful uh, satin view, kind of just rubbing you, rubbing your hand, and it's just this uh, incredible but still so detailed orchestrator. Um, I would love to do Barrio Sinfonia. Um, again, one of those pieces that I've downloaded many years ago on Napster and <laughs> just hooked to it till till now. Um, you know, Bruckner, Mahler. I mean, I, I, these are the, the repertoire that I really love, um, as well as Mozart. Um, I'd love to do a Mozart opera. It's a big shame. Um, I was supposed to do two Mozart operas this this summer, and obviously it was cancelled because of the, the COVID-19 situation. But yeah, Mozart is... Um, I have a story, a, a very, very quick story um, about Mozart. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna tell it. Uh, it. Was I remember I was assisting in uh, in the in Czech Republic, Czech Republic, and it was in Bruno, um, the city in the south, a uh, beautiful city and really good orchestra. I was uh, assisting my my previous boss, um, and he was doing a concert there of Mozart and uh, um, Hartmann and a couple of other pieces. And I remembered it was a day where uh, a certain president was elected in a very prominent country, uh, I think 2017. And uh, and so I remember arriving for rehearsal a little bit earlier, and then I saw my my uh, my then boss, and we looked at each other because we knew that the election is over. Um, a certain someone is going to be president of the prominent country, and we just looked at each other and we're like, wow. This is really happening right now. Uh, very grim, very very you know dark. It was a kind of a grayish day as well. And then we went into the rehearsal, and uh, he was conducting the Hafner Symphony by um, by Mozart. And the that one hour of rehearsal was just joyous. Was just beautiful. Uh, it started with the second movement. I remember and just put a smile. To my face, and I just forgot about all all that you know, dark thoughts. Uh, and to me, that's so special. That's so special about music. That's so powerful about music. It doesn't matter if it's contemporary music, or it doesn't matter if it's Mozart or whatever. But you know, it, it really has the ability to transport you to a different world. And in that one hour, I just um, I genuinely didn't didn't care about what was happening. Of course, we eventually have to go back to reality, but uh, yeah. The, the 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 every music has this ability to mesmerize if it's done well, I guess yeah. Okay. Uh oh, thank thank you for um Doctor Go for talking about his piano pieces. Is this uh, Shimonovsky that you're talking about? Um. Moving on. 
what advice would you give young conductors who might be interested in new music? Uh, this is actually kind of fun because um, I guess m most young conductors already have to do <laughs> new music whether they like it or not. Um, it's just kind of something that it got uh, either from a professional world that you know certain conductors don't want to learn new pieces so they're like, oh, you know, you do this. Uh, or... Um, you know, friends, composer friends, and you know their interests. Uh, they want to put something together, and they want the conductor to jump in. So, um, you know, most young conductors already have to do it. Um, so I guess the advice I would have is um, really try to find the intention behind it. Really try to find what the composer is trying to say. And uh, obviously, our role, as, especially as a young conductor, you have to organize things. You have to make things uh, work because that's your responsibility. But um, w the the sooner you can get into the music, the sooner you can you can go beyond the notes and really try to find an expression or try to find uh, the atmosphere. Um, and to me, it's so important that that music connects emotionally. Um, that's that is even the most intellectual music. Again, Lutoslavsky, I th you know, when you break down his music, you start to realize, you know, the, the methods he used are so simple. It's so um, ingenious. But for me, he's like a, a perfect um, balance between intellectualism, but still a lot of emotionalism in his music. And so I'm, I'm, I always try to find the emotional aspect of the music. I always try, because that to me um, uh, convinces the audience. And uh, and I definitely felt that when I was doing the Chelsea, um, before and after you know this coaching with Brett, and um, and that's something that I'm always looking out for um, in in my music making. I'm always looking for the special moment. Um, you know, as a as oh, I think should I should I go into into this um, as a, as an Asian conductor. Uh, many times there is this stereotype that is, is kind of running that you know you have very good technique but you are, you're not uh, you don't have a lot of musical things to say and that really annoys me because I've been I've been I've heard that you know being said to me many times many competitions and it's something that I also heard from uh, fellow other fellow Asian conductors that that's something that like people like to say um, which I think is completely not true there are some but I I would absolutely um, say that that's kind of rubbish um and where am i going with this uh ah and and so when i was preparing and si since I, I i got that feedback many times i was really kind of annoyed and i told myself okay this next competition i'm going to i am just going to focus absolutely 120 percent on music like i don't really care if things fall apart or not i just really wanted to make um make a musical statement a musical statement that I believe is true, not something that I just want to uh, um, uh, to show, but something that I absolutely believe it was true. And I remember it was Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, and um, and uh, it, I was supposed to do a, a, at the beginning where yeah, just that 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 section um, which comes back twice before the comes back twice before the the allegro, and and I really you know, not moto rubato, but I really took a chance and really tried to find a moment where the whole orchestra is really kind of sucked in and we were really trying to find that one moment to place the note. And and to me, it was very, very special. P possibly, it was only me who felt that. But, but that taught me a lesson that, you know, if every time I conduct, we can find just that one moment, then it's a success. We can, you know, even if things fall apart, we can just find that special moment together where everybody on stage and also the audience hopefully feels like we are all being held breathless. <sighs> to me, that's that is 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 it. That one moment. Um, so if we can f if we can find that in in new music, um, and dig dig deeper and try to find those moments. I mean, not all pieces are like that, of course. I totally understand. Um, but when when we can make an impact to the audience, I think that's where we are most successful. So, oh my God, I've been speaking about myself for 45 minutes, which is something that I don't usually like to do. Um, 
oh well, one one more thing. Uh, I think the great thing about doing new music, for, especially for young conductors, is that you have to be inventive about uh, what you do. So when the score calls for something, uh, there is no established tradition that this is how you do it. It has to be done this way. For example, when you do certain Mozart symphony, a certain Beethoven symphony, it has to be done this way because it was always you know, this way works. And obviously, this is you know learning from experience. But the thing about new music is there are no set ways of doing it. Every time you you approach a piece, it's a new piece, and you find the best way for you. Uh, a case in point, I remember I was studying uh, Unsuk Chin's Gugulon. I think I mentioned it in one of the previous episodes before. The first movement is in six eight. It's in kind of fast six eight, and um, and. Uh, the the rhythms that appear sometimes they are kind of six eight sometimes they're kind of three four, and uh, my way of doing it and I also I, I remember seeing a couple of videos online is to just keep it in six eight and and you know just ha- feel the three four against the six eight you know uh, kind of like the the, the Bernstein in America la pa pa pee, 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 pa, 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 pa. so you, I feel the the three four within the six eight. And um, and so that's kind of my way of doing it. But I remember speaking to uh, to to Peter about Peter at Walsh about it, and he told me, you know, oh, uh, I think you should think you should consider doing six eight here and then three four here and six eight here and three four here. And at the point I was like, oh my god, really? Uh, I, I was maybe I was not so secure about that, so I I didn't uh, take his advice. Um, but I remember watching a video of um, I believe it was Hong Kong New Music Ensemble. Uh, with the music director Liu Kok Man doing the same piece, and he he was doing six eight and then three four, and he nailed it. It was so amazing. I mean, that performance was really incredible. And so to me, there's there's no set ways. It doesn't matter what you do as long as your players understand what you do. So uh, that's the fun part about it. So you can be ex, ex extremely exploratory, um, and finding um uh ways that you can help the players not get in the way, but. Uh, but be be inventive about it. So um, I thought with that, I wanted to you know just have a quick reflection about kind of you know the the current situation. Um, it sounds vague, but three reflections about what I've learned. You know, kind of doing this series, and uh, and I think I mentioned a couple of times already. The the best way to learn is really to do, and this applies also to conducting. Um, to jump on uh, to jump on an interview series uh, is daunting, but if you, but why not? Why do you want to wait? Um, for me, it was about the perfectionism in me, the pe- for perfectionist in me. I'm always unhappy about a lot of things. I, I hate to see myself talk. <laughs> I hate to see my hate to listen to myself talk. I hate to see my own videos, but uh, I have to do it. I I have to get onto the platform and um, to to deliver my message. And so, same thing with conducting as well. The best way to learn is to do. A lot of people ask, you know, how can I blah, 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 blah. Actually, the best way is to, you know, form a little group, uh, invite some friends, buy them pizza, and just conduct, and then learn from them. So, that's what I did with, with this interview series. Um, I made a lot of mistakes, but that's fine. And that's that's okay. That's part of learning. I remember one of my teachers was saying, um, uh, you have to suck first before you become good. You have to be really bad at what you do before you become good. So that's, you know, that gives you perspective. If things are not great, it's okay. It's just a process. You can just kind of uh, fight through it. Uh, secondly, and this is something I mentioned about in the in the Zhao Bao uh, article, uh, which uh, Dedrick and I we were interviewed um, is that I mentioned there's something about the democratization of of media and of learning and that's very very exciting in the world today because literally anything you want to learn can be found on YouTube and um, you want to do um, you want to learn about you know photography you want to learn about you know, hosting a podcast or all that and there are so many great advice there of course it takes time for you to you know. To, to take that information in and eventually be a master of that. But anybody can do anything now, and uh, everybody is a creator. And this is really wonderful. I mean, I've seen um, uh, 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 Alan Cutting has a great interview series that he does. Uh, also, uh, Yao Tong, um, uh, a, a, a tuba player in, in Singapore, and he has his own. He starts. He just started his YouTube channel, uh, giving advice on you know um, 
on, on various topics, and it's really wonderful, uh, and and that's exciting because it adds to the to the um, to the vibrancy of the scene. The more the more um, these kind of outlets we have, the better it is because then the younger generation will have more things to choose from, more things to learn from. So everybody can do it and everybody should do it because in some ways, um, this is this is how the world would be, I guess. Um, you know, kind of where do we go from here in the post-COVID world? I, I've always been very... Uh, hesitant about talking about current issues in in this series because I f I feel that this is a series um, where it's kind of a safe space where we talk about music we just enjoy listening to stuff and uh, and I don't feel that it's in my place to comment on what the 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 world um, you know things yeah movements or um, because we all have our own opinions and I don't want to impose my opinions on anybody. Uh, but the more I do, and this kind of ties into uh, the the new series of uh, the new season of unboxing new music, which I'm very excited to talk about in a bit. Uh, I think it's 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 very pertinent that we face these issues and we talk about um, how uh, we come out f into this post COVID world. I, again, I don't have the answers, and if you have any. Uh, suggestions I would love to hear from everybody as well um, but the you know looking at so many orchestras especially in the United States um, having furlough or in, in some ways even cancelling entire seasons uh, it was very very disheartening and uh, everybody is really trying to figure out what to do um, and on top of that you know also dealing with um, just this falling sick or even you know some some um very unfortunate deaths uh, it's a very dark topic but i think in some ways you know learning about how to get onto a new media how to uh how to um, reach out to more people, I think this is the best opportunity to to do that. Because previously, when everybody is so busy, there's really no time to think and, and consider how can we reach out to more people. We were just kind of busy putting on rehearsals, putting on concerts. And this is really a time for reflection. And um, and uh, this media, is it's an incredible place where we're reaching out to people all over the world. You know, anyone on Facebook that... Um, it can be reached with this and and how the world becomes even smaller you know after the pandemic because now we are so much more interconnected and we have to be because we we cannot be um we're not outside so much these days so i guess uh going from here um it's it's a really good time for new music because i think small ensembles uh is good Small ensembles are, are, are agile, are mobile. It's easier for small ensembles to you know put on something like a Facebook Live, put on um, performances, and with relatively low cost as compared to the larger organizations. So I mean, the world is changed in unprecedented ways. I think we all can see um, this, and we're all wondering what's what's going to be next. Um, but I think the, the 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 real message that I'm trying to drive home is that there are a lot more opportunities. Um, in this world, um, if we think outside the box and really try to find our own way or try to project our own voices, uh, obviously the question is monetization. You know, how are we going to get paid? And that's that's a tricky topic that I don't want to go into. Perhaps n for another time. Um, but again, with the Zhao Bao interview, I remembered one thing I said was. Um, I think it's it's important to to still maintain a certain level of op optimism, um, not because we are not feeling sorrowful about what's happening in the world, but uh, but let's be optimistic about the the opportunities that that is put in front of us, and let's see how we can take that to reach even further. Uh, I remember saying something <laughs> to my friends about you know the amount of people that that uh that I have reached I have reached uh from doing this series you know far exceeds you know my wildest dreams of people coming to a new music concert for example uh in Singapore 
and and that's the beautiful part of it. Like now this is possible. Now we can actually reach out to more people. More people are aware of it. Again, whether they like it or not, it doesn't matter, but they're exposed to it. And so maybe from the exposure, they might be enticed to come in and see, oh, what's this? Oh, this is really interesting. Oh, I know this face. I, I've seen you know, this composer on this show before that you know, appeared on my Facebook. So I think hopefully in, in, in a general scheme of things that, that this would make new music less daunting for most people. Um, and finally, finally, uh, a new season of unboxing new music. I'm very, very, very excited. Uh, in July, that we have some fabulous guests coming on, um, and also I would like to to say that we will uh, for for future episodes of unboxing mu new music, we will uh, be doing Wednesdays only instead of Saturday, and um, and. What I'm actually very, very curious for the listeners out there is uh, I've, I've released this Unboxing New Music playlist where I thought it was a very good idea just to share what myself and also some of my composer friends are listening to as a way of uh, introducing um, more pieces to the audience. And I'm wondering, you know, what is the, the feedback on that? And do you guys enjoy that? Um, because on on when I post it on my Facebook, I, there is no way I can track whether that is uh, is something that people are interested in or not. So I would love to hear from you guys if that is uh, is something that I should continue doing. Uh, anyway, so upcoming episodes in July, super interesting, a whole range of topics, and this is where I wanted to go into a, a different direction with unboxing new new music. So previously we were talking with composers, uh, especially local composers, as well as uh, locally based com. Uh, performers about pieces that they love and about their own pieces and um, and this has been relatively successful I, I would say but on the new season of uh, Unboxing New Music I, I want to dive deeper into topical um, issues so uh, for next week I'm really 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 happy to have uh, Dr. Zachariah go uh, come on the show and to talk about you know folk songs and transcriptions and um and uh, Dr. Go and I go a long, long way back. He wrote a wonderful piece for my trombone ensemble uh, many years ago called Slide That. Um, and uh, Twas the Bamboo, that was the, the, the piece, the name of the piece for eight trombones. Uh, and at that point, I remembered, you know, oh my God, a, a composer has written the piece for us. And, uh, and how honored we are. And he just did it, you know, out of his goodwill. So I'm, he's always been a very inspirational figure. And I'm very happy to have him on the show. So, um, and uh, after that, we will also have uh, William Lane from Hong Kong New Music Ensemble uh, to talk about um, his experiences in building an audience for new music in Hong Kong. Uh, because Hong Kong and Singapore share many, many similarities. And so I am very curious to find, I mean, he, has, he runs an excellent program um, there, uh, um, both in terms of education, reaching out, and you know, really presenting some fabulous pieces. So I'm really excited to speak to him. Um, and uh, also my dear friend Max Reefer, who I work with at uh, Yong Su Toh. Uh, sometimes he coaches the percussion, the percussionist there, and he has a uh, a really good overview of kind of the new music scene in Asia. He's based in Malaysia, and uh, he teaches at the university UITM over there. And but he travels a lot around the region to, for example, uh, to Philippines or to Indonesia and also obviously to Singapore. And so I'm very curious to hear uh, from his perspective about kind of the, the different new music scenes uh, through the eyes of a traveling musician. So that's also um, in July. And lastly, uh, um, video games, uh, music for video games. Uh, and I'm very, very, very grateful to uh, invite uh, Lee Xiao An um, I've I've heard about him from from Emily, and uh, she mentioned I should really check him out because you know, video games. I mean, this is a completely new, at least for me, um, a, a new kind of exploding genre in the world. I mean, e gaming is huge, and my only experience with video game music is when I was preparing the orchestra for one of those uh, video games live. 
concert, and it was a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. Very, very, you know, it was, it was so loud. This was in Poland, and so I would love to hear his perspective about kind of um, video games and uh, music for video games, and in what are the things that you know is is so pertinent in this industry. Uh, we have also a lot of other guests, you know, kind of scheduled for later. But you know, these are some of the very exciting news that I'm I'm so happy to share with everyone. So. <laughs> Um, coming to the end of uh, this episode, um, thank you for joining in and thank you for asking all the questions. I hope I managed to 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 address a couple of them. Uh, oh, I, I missed out this one. Kenneth is asking, was asking, uh, what do you think you can do as a conductor to inspire more people to perform and to write? I think doing this show is one of the, the ways to do this, um, to... Um, to introduce people within Singapore to our own Singaporean composers, or introducing our Singaporean composers to the world from you know whatever people tuning in, um, and so this is really exciting. And as I mentioned also, that I'm very very keen on venturing out uh, into the region and really looking at each region and trying to see if we can you know put something together um, as kind of a united front of, of Southeast Asia because I think that this is a this is music that is very underrepresented in the world. Um, when we talk about, for example, contemporary music in Asia, everybody you know easily thinks of oh in Japan and Korea. And then when you kind of probe uh, deeper of China as well, you know, big big countries with a huge population and you know wonderful um, composers, but when you probe deeper, you start to realize that's that's about it. That's that's all there is. And how about the Southeast Asian region? My gosh, this is such a fertile ground for you know so much creativity. Um, you know, isn't it mind boggling that you know someone like De Debussy was was completely blown away by gamelan music, you know, a hundred years ago, and decided to write pieces that are inspired by that. So you know, we have a lot of interesting stuff in this region that we we should be very very proud of, and that's something that for me I want to learn more about, and which is why I'm doing this series. So um, yeah, great. I guess that's that's the end. Thank you all for joining in. Um, I'm really excited for the new season. I will put out a poster very soon. Uh, in the meantime, I would love to hear about, you know, if you guys have any feedback or any questions. Um, and, uh, yeah, hope to see you guys next week. Thanks. Bye.